Good evening. Today is Tuesday, January 10th. I'd like to call this regular uh, meeting of the Board of Education together. Members present are Mrs. Canelli, Mr. Convertito, Mr. Liu, Mrs. Gerber, Ms. Iacono, Mr. Dwyer, Mr. Fatabeen, Mr. Carey will be late this evening, and Mrs. Brand. Will you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic Uh, the first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. The recommended motion is that the Board of Education move the minutes to the regular meeting of December 13th, 2011. Do I have a motion? Moved by Mrs. Gerber, seconded by Mr. Dwyer. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Abstentions. <laughs> Paul? Are you abstaining? No. I don't think you're at that meeting. Let the record show that uh, Mrs. Brand, Mr. Dwyer, Ms. Iacono, Ms. Gerber, Mr. Liu, Mr. Convertito, and Mrs. Kennelly were in favor, and Mr. Fatabeen abstained. Okay, that's the meeting you guys said. Thank. <laughs> Um, next item on our agenda are reports. Um, our first report will be from Ludlow High School. Thank um, things are relatively busy at Ludlow High School right now, considering we have midterm, midterm exams coming up on the 19th. Um, also, seniors are submitting forms for internships, which begin in May. Um, and they are also starting to hear about college acceptances, which is exciting for many people. Um, as far as clubs and activities go, um, the AFS club, the American Field Service Club, um, is getting ready for a trip to New Orleans, a service trip. Also, the music students are fundraising for a trip um, in the spring to California. And there was a lot of volunteering going on um, by FLHS students back to the community over the holiday break, which was great. Also, um, the Spirit Week um, and the Winter Pep Rally were very exciting for all students. Those happened back in December. Um, there's a new piano in the front foyer, which students are encouraged to play, which is very exciting to hear when you're walking through the hallways. Um, also, the Candlelight Concert was a huge success. Um, Mrs. Huber's textile and design class won first, um, first place in the state on their tests, which were taken back in the spring. So that was a huge accomplishment. And also one of our science teachers, Mr. Vital, recently published in a chemistry journal. And that's it. Great. Thank you. Our ward representative isn't here. Mrs. Brand, Board of Health. Board of Health meeting was last night. Um, there were several things that came up that were relevant for the Board of Ed. One of them are the health assessments, which were the physical exams that are required for entrance to school as well as for um, sports. They were approved unan um, unanimously. There is something, though, that did come up that I, I actually raised, and that is relative to the Connecticut concussion law. And I asked whether or not, because of that, if um, the Board of Health was going to consider that in their initial exams. And they said basically for two reasons they would not. And one of them was that they felt that there hadn't been a real lot of documentation. It hasn't been established really as a standard of practice. And the second thing is that they also felt it was going to go beyond the Board of Health's purview for something that doesn't follow statutes, and, and it was, didn't follow in the charter. So for both of those reasons, they felt it would go beyond their scope. There was a question from a Board of Health member as to whether or not the board would consider such a thing. And I went back and looked. We do not have a policy on that, though there is a state um, statute that it, uh, there is a procedure that takes place within the schools by the school nurses, but also on um, the fields with, with, with sports. So there is something, it was actually a, a, a legislation that was passed, and I think it looks like May 2010, so it's fairly recent, but I think would recommend that we consider it for a policy because I think it is something we should be covering. And there is another element that came up um, that I, I think 
may not be very clear to people in the community. One of the things that happened when we saw changes in um, the administration for medication was that the school nurse can tell teachers or people who have been trained, to, they can, are allowed legally to delegate admit, for them to administer medication to a student when there are on a school field trip. However, it is no longer permitted by the law for a school nurse to give anyone medications for distribution when they are on a non-field trip, i.e. an extracurricular activity, the exception being sporting events and intramurals. And that is a significant shift. We have issues that are coming up right now within the school district, and they are um, whether we're having uh, events like uh, ski trips, whether or not there is an obligation. If a student is a special ed or has a 504 plan, then accommodations will be made. But otherwise, they will not. So again, that might be something that the, the uh, subcommittee for policy might also want to um, look at, at least make sure that everyone understands the implications of this and the limits. And I think that is it. Oh, the only other thing I was going to mention is um, I am one of the um, CES representatives. I know we don't have it down here, but we are allowed to have two. And, and I think that's it. Thanks. Um, thank you, Mr. Convertito. Uh, policy committee will be meeting next week, or I'm um, sorry, two weeks, the 23rd. Uh, Special Project Extending Building Committee, uh, Sherman uh, renovations going uh, going along. The kitchen addition has been uh, framed out and enclosed in steel. The foundation for the bump out in the front uh, has been poured. They're gutting the main, what used to be the main offices uh, at this time. And uh, we're in the process now. There's an RFP out uh, to hire a clerk of the works just to track the progress. Thank you. Mr. Dwyer. Uh, <clears throat> the first uh, CES meeting is on Thursday. I uh, won't be able to attend it, but uh, Mrs. Brand will be. Uh, there's a new, uh, I'll say, ad hoc committee uh, uh, you'll see on the agenda called Pro Building Projects Review Committee. Uh, the intent is to see if we can't streamline, make more efficient uh, the decision-making process um, in capital projects. Uh, the first meeting was held uh, later this, uh, late this afternoon. Most of the discussion related to the non-reoccurring capital projects and the process by which those will get uh, uh, reviewed by the various town bodies. Uh, the goal that everybody had in the room is streamlining uh, the process, trying to compact the time. Um, and so uh, there was a lot of discussion, especially around the role of the TFC um, and the original charge of the TFC was that projects could get referred to them through the Board of Selectmen, and this year they seem to be uh, referred to them by a variety of town bodies. Um, and so it was agreed that it really should go back to the original process, that they would only get involved if the Board of Selectmen uh, asked them to be involved. Um, uh, there's another meeting scheduled for about a month from now, um, and so more information will be given then. If any of you have uh, comments that you think should be brought up at that type of a meeting, send them along to me or Dr. Title, who also attended the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Fadabeen. Um, okay, the policy committee is awaiting, as was mentioned, their first organizational meeting on uh, January 23rd. Uh, the Stratfield Building uh, Committee uh, had a meeting scheduled, but that was canceled. I don't know of another meeting being rescheduled at this point. <coughs> the Transportation Advisory Safety Committee um, there is a, um, a uh, review and process for a uh, change in a bus stop that has not yet been decided. Thank you. Mrs. Gerber. Um, okay, Parks and Rec met uh, about a week and a half before Christmas, and the one issue related to um, school issues in a sense was uh, the very preliminary proposal for an outdoor ice rink um, at Smith Richardson Golf Course. It'll be in the parking lot um, if it happens and uh, this would be a way to uh, kind of be able to use the space year round. Um, I guess a lot of people cross country ski there when there is snow so there, there would be an outdoor ice rink. The restaurant there would be able to stay open year round um, and it would obviously be used for public skate, for Cub Scouts, brownies, and so on. Um, but also there was a hope to have that be the practice space for the co-op hockey team, for the high school co-op hockey team. Um, it's very preliminary. It was really just kind of testing the waters to see 
how people felt about it. Everyone at the meeting that night seemed positive. Um, they were talking about it in relation to uh, the ice rink at Longshore in Westport. You know, the similar idea. It'll be open on the sides. It'll be covering on the top. Um, and, uh, you know, but it will obviously be bringing in revenue, uh, hopefully. And it was kind of mentioned in the sense of piggybacking on a proposal that they're going to be putting forth for uh, extensive renovations at Smith Richardson, which are also, um, I guess, needed. So it was, the thought would be to do the two um, together. So that was one thing there. Um, then the only other thing was. Um, they're sodding the baseball fields at Gould Manor. I'm sure anyone who's driven past there has seen that. Uh, the girls' softball field um, should be open by August or September, and the neighbors of the softball field have withdrawn their lawsuit uh, against the town. Good. So that's it. Excellent. Um, I have nothing to report from the RTM. Uh, as you all know, they approved our union contracts. So um, the roof. Oh, my goodness. How could I have forgotten? <laughs> After, all that, After all that, they approved our roof warranty program. I'm so, I can't believe I forgot that. After agenda after agenda, after many postponements, our roof warranty uh, proposal was approved by the RTM. So we will get started on that this summer, correct? Right. Okay, excellent. That's it. Uh, Mrs. Canelli. Um, SEPTA had their cookie fundraiser in December, and apparently they were very um, pleased with the results of that. They raised over $1,000 uh, through that fundraiser. So if, if anybody bought or provided, thank you um, on their behalf. And they have their um, first meeting for me to attend uh, will be tomorrow. It's actually a social event at the Pilot House at 7 o'clock. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Liu. Um, Fairfield Woods Building Committee met the other night. Project is coming along beautifully. Great, excellent. We win the prize. Let's see, superintendent's report. I'm going to um, reserve my time, as the congressman say, for the end of the meeting when I'll have a lot to say about the budget. I do want to just comment that um, Mr. Dwyer's uh, report was very accurate about the meeting in terms of the substance, I should also want to point out that the spirit of cooperation in the room was very nice to see and everybody appears to want to get on the same page and it's not adversarial and I think we're going to be in a good place with that. Great. Okay, next up, old business, approval of a safe school climate plan. The recommended motion is that the Board of Education approve the safe school climate plan. Moved by. Mrs. Brand, seconded by anyone? Mr. Fatterbeam? Discussion? Does anybody have any comments? Mrs. Kennelly? I feel we're addressing everyone, but addressing Andrew. Um, three comments. Um, first, I was wondering about on page 10, there's the mention of, and this is, I'm, I'm not sure which way I'd go on this. On page 10, regarding the case managers for both the victim and the perpetrator, do you think we should consider? Um, being specific about whether it can be the same person for both or I mean that's kind of uncharted waters obviously but just it was something that occurred to me uh, no I think we need to really make individual decisions about individual issues so I think the more flexibility in this plan allows schools to make decisions based on the needs of those kids at that time okay. so I don't always think that would be might be but not always um, my second question was, um, obviously, there's the uh, mention of the survey with, you know, all of the criteria and what we'd be hoping to find out. I was wondering what we'd have in place regarding an assessment of the interventions. I don't think a survey, per se, will quite work the same for that because hopefully it's not as large a body of people being questioned. But what measure will be in place for assessing are we achieving what we want to achieve through the schools? Well, I think when you do an annual assessment, you're going to get perception data on the overall perspective of the community, teachers, parents, not just teachers, all school employees, parents and students. So that will give you trends in terms of the perception of this kind of work. Um, as in terms of the individual interventions, I think that would be based on, you could look at, for the perpetrator, re repeat offenses. Sure. And whether or not the student is actually repeating the offenses. For the victim, you would want to look at the stop to victimization as, you know, as the measure, and that would be based both on the data in terms of new disciplinary refer referrals or incident reports, 
as well as perception data of those kids that you would seek in the in the intervention section itself. Right. So I don't know that there'd be a a measure that's as consistent as the overall annual assessment of school climate as a whole. Yeah, I guess I'm I'm just thinking that the one sub sub group of that that we, we wouldn't be able to put out is unless there was a question are you a victim who has reported it and is currently being serviced by an intervention plan unless we had that broken out mm -hmm. by a specific question it would be whereas the rest of this is you know quite scientific that would be anecdotal and not that it wouldn't be reliable right but in terms of our having any means of assessing are the plans working the way we want our reports from you would be purely anecdotal then for individual kids yes um, and then my third question, um, I brought this up last time. I did, by the way, see um, the PowerPoint presentation at Stratfield, which was uh, very well received and it, um, very informative. And you held the floor for over an hour really well, and thank you for that. Um, and one slide that was added, which I had asked about the last time, was regarding the um, inclusion of law enforcement, which I appreciated hearing there. My only question is that it's still um, not listed anyone here in terms of any chain of command if, if something is perceived, do we need to have in print who's contacting law? I mean, again, in case of if a teacher sees it, what is the actual the principal chain of would be contacting law enforcement? Is that something that needs to be included? I guess is my question. Because it no, it says the principal and or her, his or her designated. I apologize. Would I was looking under all the bullet points, so I apologize. I missed that one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any further discussion, Mrs. Brand? And then Mr. Convertito. On page four, we have a list of district school climate team. We have um, the climate specialists, community members, parents, and students. One of the things I wanted to know is whether or not for the district team, what age group of students we're um, targeting? I'm, I'm targeting high school students, mm -hmm. but I'm considering middle school students right, that's, as well. Okay. And, and the other thing is, how are we reaching out to get the community members? Um, I have, I've reached out specifically to um, some community members because of their role. For example, um, Ginny Paulus, who works at Park and Rec and does a lot of the youth group, mm -hmm. um, she made sense to me. I've talked to the police. There will be some um, law enforcement representatives, so I've made direct contact with those. And then I've had some um, referrals to me of people, mental health professionals in the district, um, who are also, happen to also be parents. Um, and some additional parents, P, um, PTA council. Um, so I've kind of made a logical connection to some folks who, who have a, a horse in this race, right. so to speak. Right. And, then, um, and then certainly they're you know, giving me other referrals and possibilities. I haven't yet heard, I put out some feelers to the faith-based community. I haven't gotten any takers yet, but I'm still working on that, so. Yeah, I appreciate it, because I know that was something I had mentioned. I also, I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, you made a change in some of the wording. I responded to all of the feedback you guys but I, gave me last time. Because so. it, you actually in, didn't just say just the principal, you also said school climate mm -hmm. cl um, specialist with reporting, so I, I appreciate that change. Thank you. And, and I think the last thing I, I asked before, but I know this is still a work in progress, but we had a bullying policy, and I just want to know where we are to date, what the appropriate actions a parent would take if they think their child is being bullied, and what they would expect as a response, because we're still, this is still quite an undertaking. Mm -hmm. But do we have, right now, school climate specialists in place, or are we still using the principal? Uh, right now, we're in the process of training um, school climate specialists and the administration around the, some of this work. So we're in a training place mm -hmm. um, right now. Um, as you can imagine, the training is pretty extensive. This is a, a pretty far-reaching right. policy. Um, if, in fact, this plan is improved, approved tonight or, or as soon as it's approved, the next step will be to impanel these teams um, and then do some training of the teams. Um, and certainly, the within 30 days of the approval of this policy, the website for the district and each school will have a page devoted to school climate that will have the plan, will have what to do if you're concerned, how to make a report, all of those. And then slowly but surely, I'm going to do what I would call the dog and pony circuit to PTAs mm -hmm. and out into the community to help people understand um, you know, what they would do. It's gonna, it, 
it's going to be a process, but the, the web is going to be the initial place where if people are concerned, they can get good information. So you're going to have, a, have this up and running, if you will, in roughly a month. It will be a sort of a, um, a rough approach. The bullying piece will be, you know, the, how to make a report, what right, the report right. looks like, right. what That's the investigation the right. will look like. Those kinds of things will be initially implemented. The district team, all of that's going to be a slow progression. If you look at the timeline, I, I proposed a timeline to give people a sense because this is, this, is, this is work for now and ongoing work. Every year there will be some work attached to this. But I gave you a, a um, kind of a proposed timeline that looks at full implementation um, beginning for the 12-13 school year. But certainly, your policy has already changed the definition of bullying. There are some requirements to reporting and, and those kinds of things that are in play now and will get tighter as we do more and more training out. Yeah, my only concern, again, while we're in that, this year of transition, that we still have something that parents can address their concerns and a way to handle it while we're moving forward. Oh, absolutely. Okay. That's, absolutely. That was, that was really all I care about. I think I, they just want to know, well, we're not here, but we're not here yet. So you'd recommend if they are still having a problem then to go to the principal at this Absolutely. point? Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Mr. Convertito. I had just uh, two very brief points. Um, one, I think it's a fairly extensive plan. Um, my concern is, is there's what I perceive to be some extensive training of staff um, involved. Uh, is that allocated for, and, and I don't want to steal anybody's fire for later on in the meeting, um, <laughs> in the 2012-13 budget, and since training is going to be starting now, is there money in the budget now to do that? Um, we're asking people to take on staff and administrators take on existing roles, and I'm, you know, a firm believer that you know you pay for performance, and so is that an issue with this plan? Well, in terms of professional development, we are doing some training now and we're using some of our current PD monies to do that. Um, obviously, the extensive training, the rollout of training, pretty much everyone um, is going to, we have to work on the plan for how to make that a reality. So we're looking at, um, I'm, my guess is there will be some cost to it, but um, we're also going to use some of the internal resources that we're training now to help roll out the training plan. We're looking at webinars and kind of things that give people a way to get that. So that's part of it. Um, did I miss to get, your question? To get more specific, I mean, each school is going to have a school climate specialist. Um, administrators, I don't know how they fit that into there. So my assumption is we're going to designate somebody, or they will designate somebody within the school to do that. Will there be additional compensation? Um, like we pay a coach or, or, or somebody else t to take on that role? That's, uh, we really took the section of the law that says at no additional cost, seriously, <laughs> um, you know, to try to do the best we can. There are some costs that we did put in the budget, and, and Dr. Title will talk to you about those, but um, we don't know what the impact is going to be yet. We're all concerned. Um, myself included, in the school climate coordinator role, we're concerned about being able to do the job well. It's important work. It needs to be done. And there's a commitment, a firm commitment on the part of the district and the schools and the people who've invested their time already to do this in doing the work. We are concerned that, that we're going to be able to do it well, given that we all also have full-time jobs that we already had. Um, we don't know the impact yet. Um, and so we've kind of decided we're going to move forward to implement this, to do our level best to do it well and at no additional human resource costs for this first iteration. If we find that we are not able to do it well and we need to deal with some other, um, whether it's stipend kind of work or those kinds of things, then we'll be back to you um, next budget season to talk about the impact what we were able to accomplish, what we would like to accomplish, and, and what we weren't able to accomplish as a result. Um, we just don't have enough data to come here and for, for me to be able to sit here and feel like I, I'm able to um, sell a new program. Uh, it's not an, it, the state legislature made it clear they're not asking us to spend more money. 
Our question is whether we want to just comply or whether we want to do the work well. That's our question. And, and I guess that gets to, to the basis of my question. If you're asking people to take on more responsibility, and it seems to me this is a fairly significant responsibility, um, I, I think there needs to be, or we need to at least anticipate that there's going to be some cost involved in that. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, my second uh, concern is lack of uh, a detailed appeals process. Yeah, we had a discussion. Uh, that was a part of what we talked about um, at the last meeting. And upon reflection, and I just didn't feel like we had the, the knowledge base to put together an appeals process for this 1.0 iteration. So uh, clearly the principal is at the building level and central office, and there are some clear lines um, to central office that are available to families in the event of an appeal or, um, but right now I just don't think we have the understanding of how this is going to flesh out. So I would see an appeals process being fleshed out in version 2.0 or perhaps even 1.5. Just jump in on the budget part because I don't want to say there, there is a cost we're carrying in the budget that's non-personnel cost and that's for the survey. Um, approximately $30,000. Uh, we've determined that's a hard number we can, you know, stand behind. Um, but there are no uh, human resource costs. But there is a cost to uh, doing a more complicated, to doing a better survey, which will give us better data. Uh, so we don't want to say it's completely a cost-free item, but we don't have it in the, uh, on the people's side right now until we have a better idea of how much the impact is. Then we'll be back. Okay. I, again, my only issue for bringing that up is that if, we want staff to be engaged in this. and uh, They're going to be foregoing some other activity, whether it's personal time or something else, um, or you know, tutoring or, or whatever to, to be involved in this. And I think that yeah. that's a very real possibility that we need to be aware of going and, forward. And now, I agree. Uh, I think we just have to see exactly what that impact is and assess it, because something we'll have to give. It's only so many hours in the day. Uh, Mr. Dwyer. I, too, found the uh, document to be uh, very responsive to the uh, last uh, meeting's uh, discussions, so I appreciated that. A couple of uh, uh, questions. Um, the change agent is uh, designated as the school specialist, but I presume implied uh, in all of this is that the principal has the primary role in creating the culture in the, uh, at their individual school. Yes. Um, the second is I, I, I think it would be helpful to those who are engaged in this to keep some, I wouldn't say a time study, but some record of their time commitment to this so that six, nine months from now when we're trying to say what does this cost us, we're not uh, trying to remember what the time commitment was, but that we have some sense of it so that the next time uh, Mr. Convertito asks the question, <laughs> we have a little bit more definitive answer. Um, on the, uh, it's not a page, but Appendix 4, which is the incident report, and it uh, has the section that's called Name of Alleged Victim. Um, I think often bullying starts not uh, targeted to an individual, but when a, a group of kids get together in that uh, uh, stupid comment, that stupid joke, that thing that is directed at a class of people. And is there a uh, uh, suggestion within this that if a student hears consistently a, another group of students making comments that are aimed at a class of people but not an individual, that that student could file such a report so that um, the district could take action on it? Yes, I think part of the training when you work with kids and with teachers and with parents is to help them understand what we want them to start reporting to us. So we don't just want to wait for the victimization of a single student, but certainly the reporting of, of behavior that we may not see. This stuff hap doesn't happen in the presence of adults usually. Um, and so I think we want students to tell us where things are happening. We may not act on it in a, in a method of disciplinary action, but at least give us information to the kinds of things that are that are driving that kind of mean-spiritedness so that we can intervene on a teaching side and not on a, this isn't, it's not always about the disciplinary action. In fact, that's the least powerful change agent is disciplinary action. So I think it, what we want to do is as we roll this out to kids, to adults about 
reporting, I'd rather see more reports than less. It, so mm -hmm. if we have a dramatic increase in the number of reports, that's okay. Um, we're going to, each report will be taken seriously and reviewed and considered as to what next steps would be. Someone reporting that a group of students are using language that might be discriminatory but not targeted in any individual, that would have a different response than a targeted act. So we'd have to, you know, the, the people doing this work would make those decisions as the reports came in. But certainly we'll be encouraging people to report more often than not. Tell us what's happening and we can act on it. Um, how we act on it is what's going to be important. Thank you. L last comment. So this, this is about what you're saying. Okay. Um, well, I can't say okay. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a follow-up on what Mrs. Leonardi just said. It is. Um, having gone to the training provided by Ms. Leonardi, it was very well laid out the idea of if you see something, say something, and also the idea that if it's reached the point of bullying, it's too late. There was such a strong emphasis on the mean-spirited behavior, and which would absolutely fit exactly what you're saying. Stop the mean-spirited behavior before it finds a target. And, you know, really let's, let's be proactive in that way. So that was very much a part, at least, of the training that came to the PTA. Thank you. And the last comment, I'd like to follow up on Mrs. Brand's uh, comment about who's on the climate team. Um, the groups that you mentioned seem to be the, quote, professionals, and I would repeat a comment I made at the last month's meeting that uh, that student who graduated from our schools four, five, six, mm -hmm. seven years ago who have a personal fresh experience of perhaps uh, experiencing bullying in a way that we didn't want to see, mm -hmm. I think they have a perspective that ought to be heard on the school climate team uh, that goes beyond the, quote, professional uh, in that area. So I'd like you to give strong consideration to that. Yeah, I, I'm not averse to it. I just haven't figured out a way how to get them yet. But I, I'm working. I'm working on it. I'm done. Thank you. Okay, great. We're ready to go. To, is there any public comment? Great. Seeing none, is the board prepared to vote? All in favor? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank I'd you. I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Leonardi for the work she's done on this. She stepped up to the plate, took the initiative, saw something that needed to be done, taken on. I didn't have to twist her arm or anything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next item is a discussion of the Board of Education bylaw. I, did I skip? Oh, sorry. Um, understanding of on the health insurance. Uh, the recommended motion is that the Board of Education postpone approval of the understanding on health insurance to the next regular board meeting, January 24th, 2012. Moved by Mr. Carey, seconded by Mrs. Gerber. Um, I would just like to comment that this is simply a procedural move. The MOU is still not ready. Um, we are in the process of, um, we've set up a meeting, uh, Dr. Title and I, with the first selectman and the chairman of the Board of Finance to see if we can't iron out the details so that we'll have something to act upon for the January 24th meeting. Um, and again, um, we're basically waiting on them. So this is just a procedural move. Mrs. Brand. Relative to what that next meeting is going to have, did I read in Dr. Title's note that also um, um, the Assistant Town Attorney Canelli is also reviewing this document? Oh, uh, when I met with the first selectman about the issues around this, he said he wanted counsel to review it. Mm -hmm. um, so he may choose her. That, that was my understanding of what he would do or he might have somebody else review it, but that he wanted a, a lawyer to look at it from his perspective and he'd bring that to the table for the meeting that Pam referenced. Then if I may, following, thank you, following that, since we're gonna be looking this uh, um, at the, on the 24th, there was um, a statute that I had some concerns about that I, I, I'm not in a- This is just on the postponement. I agree, but in order to be, have it for the 24th, meaning a legal opinion, since Ms. Kennelly is going to be reviewing it. We don't know that Ms. Kennelly is going to be renewing it. Regal Council, there's a Connecticut general statute, chapter 172, section 10-256, misappropriation of school money. 
And the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this specifically is that I'm not an attorney, but I would want as a board member to be assured that what I'm going to be voting on would be legal. And we will be voting on it on the 24th. And I could wait, but then it would be too late. And so I, if we are going to have some legal counsel look at it, I think it would be appropriate to at least, I would feel better if that was looked at. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Kennelly. Just one quick question that the um, wording of the motion says postpone approval of. Um, does that mean that it would not be a discussion item that night for a vote at the subsequent meeting? That that would not be the scenario, that there would be any discussion and vote that night? We'll discuss. I mean, it's, yes. Yeah, discussion and approval. It's the same procedures that we always follow. When we'd been discussing bylaws, one of the topics that had come up was the idea of discussion one meeting with the vote to follow. That, that, that was as a general framework, and I was wondering if that, that just... That motion failed at the... Bylaws. So I just wanted to check if it... I knew it would apply sometimes and other times not. Mr. Liu. But to follow up on Mrs. Kennelly's question, to be clear, we are going to have this before us to vote on at the next meeting. It's not going to just be something that is worked out and then it's part of the budget, which has been the problem that some of us have been trying to drive home here. We have um, to vote on the proposal. We have to vote on, accept, on the approval of the understanding of a health insurance. So basically then, is there, through the chair to Dr. Title, there is a number that's floating out there, and is that number already for, is it already included in your budget? Yes. And yet we haven't voted on it yet. No, that's not entirely true. Mr. Carey, oh. would you like to? Yeah, to, to that point, and, and Mr. Kelly and Mr. Liu's question, this has been before this board three times, this particular document. Um, we asked the last board, asked the superintendent to uh, review and bring forth a new MOU he went to the chair of the Board of Finance and our new first selectman, the interim first selectman at the time, came up with a document, brought it before this board. The board gave suggestions uh, for ads and changes to that document. He went back, made the ads and changes to those documents, brought it back before the board. Got consensus from the board that we are happy what we were looking at, including the dollar amount that uh, we were agreeing to. Um, the question I think that really was at hand at those meetings was, or, or the addition that, that at least I asked for, which I think is a sticking point, was to get a date certain that the town would be getting up to the 125 percent. So if you recall, the part of the issue was how much surplus we we're going to carry uh, in the uh, insurance fund. Uh, what was asked of us was 2x. Uh, the ultimately we want to do is work our way down the 125 percent of IBNR. The town wants to work its way up to 125% at IBNR. Um, there was no date certain the town had to be there, but we had to carry 2X. So one of the things that the board asked for was to um, put a date certain in. I think the challenge that I heard from the first select when he came and spoke and asked us to postpone this was that he wanted to understand the financial <coughs> impact of that to the town, how quickly that was going to happen. So right now there's a document that the superintendent has brought, as far as I see it, to the board. The board has given affirmation that we are happy with it. We're waiting for the first selectman to act on this document. He can either say that's fine and we'll agree to it and we can vote on it, or uh, he can change it and then we have to look at it and, and have our council look at it. It's, but, it's but my still, understanding of where we are. But still going back to then whether or not this board seemed to be happy with it and they passed back different drafts, it hasn't been voted on, so we don't have it final, finalized. So how do we have a number in the budget? We had a sense of the body of what we all agreed on for the first page of that the could MOU. change, though, what you said we're saying. Possibly, this is not, why some not, of us not the dollar amount hasn't. No, the the percentage doesn't change. And is this? I mean, also to to Mrs. Brand's point, do we have? legal counsel from this, from our point of view? Because I hear a lot about talking about... I just want to stick to the... Board. No, no, this no, is a I, motion to postpone. I understand that, but in order to sometimes postpone, some of us have to understand how, what we're giving up to postpone. As a point of information, Madam Chair? Yes. 
the members of the board who were pre-existing members have the last copy of this document. It was presented to us in a meeting. And as a matter of fact, Mr. Matola and Mr. Fadabin helped to structure that with our attorney, which was our direction to the superintendent. It was never voted on, though. It just no, happened to be here. Okay, and this I is why some of us were having questions about is why, why wasn't this sort of talked about as a board? Is this something we are bound to? And how does it affect the Board of Education, not just the town of Fairfield? Mr. Fadabin. Um, I, I just want to see if I can understand this and where we are and if I'm accurate. We have an existing agreement that has been signed by the former um, superintendent. Yes. It's my understanding that that agreement is still in force and effect. Yes. We have proposals for a new agreement. Yes. It's my understanding there is no new agreement. That is correct. It's my understanding that we don't know what that new agreement is going to be yet because the parties have not yet come to agreement. And that's my understanding is why they're meeting. Correct. So I don't know what this new agreement is going to say, whether it's going to be the same as the other proposals or whether the first selectman is going to have his own influence and thoughts as to what shape that new agreement will, will take. Um, until I see an agreement brought forth, I don't know what it is yet. So I think um, we don't have an agreement other than the agreement that has been already signed at this point. Yes, and, and I'll ask Dr. Title just to provide some clarification um, on the proposal. Um, because we did get clarification and um, on on and feedback from the first selectman, I'll let Dr. Right. Teichel speak to that, and that's how we were able to have a number to work with for the budget. Right. I mean, my concern with this all along has been I needed some guidance uh, about how to budget for health insurance, um, and that um, the sticking point was simply the length of time the town was willing to commit to get up to its fair share of the health insurance fund. Mm -hmm. um, both the chairman of the Board of Finance who sat in those meetings, the chief fiscal officer, and the first selectman all said we are perfectly comfortable with you budgeting at two times the IBNR when you build your budget. So I built the budget that way. You'll see it in there. It's going to go to the board for approval. If you don't like that number, you want to change the number, knock yourselves out. It's up to you. That was what I did. I have no other guidance to go by. Um, so it was uh, clear to me that um, that first page was not an issue in dispute, um, that the issue in dispute was the timing. That does not, in fact, this, this budget. Um, but I don't have a you know, motion from the Board of Finance on it. I don't have a motion from the um, first selectman on it. Um, I have an email and I've had a lot of discussions. I brought this issue up in June okay, to get out ahead of this thing so that we would have clarity about how to budget for this. I've been working on this with them. Um, we have an agreement on the substance of it. And so I budgeted it that way. Again, you got two weeks. If you don't like the way the budget number is, it's your purview to change it. But I can't force anybody to sign a document and I won't you know, I, so that's where we are. On the postponement only, Mr. Fadabin, do you have a follow-up? A follow-up question. Um, are the proposed budget numbers, which I don't know what they are because I have not seen them, are they consistent with the existing agreement that has been signed? The it all depends on how you interpret the existing agreement that was signed. <laughs> Do you believe them to be consistent with the, and is it you're in, do you believe them to be consistent with the agreement that has been signed? I think that can be argued either way. Do you believe that? <laughs> I'm mean, serious. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons we wanted to clarify this, because it was not clear what the target was. That was the whole issue last year. And so we said, we want a target to hit. And so we have a target to hit that is clear now, and that's the one that we budgeted to. I can understand it post uh, Mr. Liu, you haven't oh, been sorry. recognized. I, I just want to emphasize we're talking about a procedural thing to postpone. We have no MOU to vote on. Again, if you are not happy as a board member with the number that is in the budget, you may adjust it up or down. That's why we shouldn't be having this discussion right now. Mr. Co Mr. Convertito. Uh, with, all, with all 
with due respect to uh, board members who have been through this process for the last six months, there's five of us on this board who have no idea, okay, what this is, okay, um, other than having sat over there and read the documentation. And I, I find it um, cumbersome for us to be put in a position to postpone for approval something that we will see for the first time on the 24th. Um, and I would offer a friendly uh, recommendation uh, that the the motion, I, I, I would just, I mean, the way the motion sits now, I, I would vote against it. I would like to see the presentation on the 24th and vote on the following meeting. Yep. Um, I, I don't know, I don't know why, and, and my general understanding of this is what we're doing is backing into this two times IBNR and putting it on our side of the budget when it's really a town liability. And if the town doesn't want to step up to their 1.25 percent, uh, then I don't know why we should step up to, to two times that. Um, and again, I'm unclear as to the whole repercussions of this, but if you're going to put it in front of me on the 24th without any documentation ahead of time, I'm going to have a tough time uh, moving forward on that. It's a really a procedure. This is simply a procedural thing. I have no MOU to give you to vote on this evening. But the motion says for approval. I will not be prepared to approve anything on the 24th. That's perfectly fine. Then postpone it again. You have to postpone the budget. You can't. There's the, that's the gotcha that we've been. That's why I was so clear at the last meeting. Is that let's have this tonight. I can't give you a document the first selectman has you not given You can give me. us what you have so far, and Don't, this is something I, you that... You have it already. Mr. Fadabeen. I, I, I think this is just a motion postponed. It, there's sort of independent issues. We're budgeting for what we have budget for. It's, it's independent whether or not uh, what the effect of that memorandum of understanding will or will not be. We, we should formulate a budget based on our best information, as Dr. Tal has, as to what the budget should be. Uh, and it's independent of that agreement. Either it's going to be consistent with the agreement or it's not going to be consistent with the agreement. But we're obligated to, to put forth a budget that in our best um, opinion is a good budget for the district, independent of any agreement. So I think we're moving forward, in my understanding, putting together a budget that is appropriate and one that is going to serve the district. And that's what we're doing, and that's independent of the, this agreement. Thank you. Mr. Dwyer. Uh, through you to Dr. Title, is it possible that uh, perhaps uh, a document that the first selectman is uh, ready to sign off on would be ready for one of the two budget review meetings that we have so that we could review it in one meeting and still meet the deadline of meet, uh, voting on the 24th? I don't know. Mrs. Brand. Again, relative for perhaps preparation, because it does um, involve the internal service fund, and that's why we have actuarials, is it possible to have AN representatives at the table to answer board's questions at that same meeting? I'm not, that might facilitate this? No, we, we can ask them if they're available. We're talking about the 24th? Yes, I am. We can check with them if that's the board's desire. They've come before. Mr. Carey? Yeah, I, um, and I'm sensitive to Mr. Convertino's concern, and I can't believe I'm going to have to do this for a procedural motion, but I'm going to ask, put forth the motion to call the question. Is there a second? <laughs> Mrs. Gerber? I just vote on it. All in favor of calling the question? Mrs. Brand, Mr. Carey, Mr. Fatterbeam, Mr. Dwyer, Ms. Iacono, and Mrs. Gerber. Opposed? Mr. Liu, Mr. Convertito, and Ms. Canelli. Six to three. Six to three passes. Oh, thank you. All right. Um, move to vote on the regular motion. <coughs> that the Board of Education postpone approval of the understanding on the health insurance to the next regular meeting. Is there any public comment on this motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Mr. Carey, Mr. Fadabeen, Mr. Dwyer, Ms. Iacono, Mrs. Gerber voting in favor. Opposed? Mrs. Brand, Mr. Liu, Mr. Convertito, and Ms. Canelli. Thank you. The next item on the agenda, the motion passes. 
Um, next item on the ad agenda is discussion of Board of Education bylaw items that were postponed from the December 13th, 2011 Board of Education me meeting. Um, as you all know, there, was, there were three holdover items from the last meeting that you have on enclosure number three, um, Board of Education bylaw items for discussion. Um, is there anything anyone wishes to discuss, Mr. Fadabine? What I would like to do is make a motion to refer this to committee, the policy committee, which is going to meet January 23rd and maybe come back with a recommendation since this is a policy. Is there or a, a it's, It relates to a policy which is a bylaw change. Is there a second? Uh, Mrs. Canelli, discussion on the motion to move to policy. Okay. Mr. Liu. Just to give some background for policy, um, one of the things I think is, is really important is that this, uh, this five days, business days prior to a meeting, uh, I, again, I'm not trying to force uh, Dr. Title to hurry this work any more than it. I know you have lots and lots to do, but I wanted you to try to appreciate it from our point of view, which is the history of, of how we got to sort of one meeting a month. We used to have two meetings a month, an educational meeting and a business meeting, and at one meeting things were proposed, and then at the next meeting they were voted, which gave the board plenty of time to discuss and to think and to do our homework to make some of these really important decisions that uh, we do to um, move forward in our schools. Now we have, if we get something late on Friday afternoon, sort of less than, than two business days. If they're thrown at us um, to, to vote on that on, a, on an upcoming Tuesday meeting, it's extremely little time to do the kind of due diligence that I personally believe needs to be done. It's, um, it's I just really find it incredibly difficult and, and don't want to put our community in the kind of place where we have to make these quick decisions um, on just less than two business days worth of, 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 um, of review. So if we can't do the other where we've asked for presentation and then vote, then I think at the very least we, we need to have something that gives us the amount of time that we can do some due diligence on this. Anybody else on the motion to move to policy subcommittee? Is there any public comment on the motion to move to public, uh, move this item to the policy committee? Seeing none, is the board prepared to vote? All in favor? Uh, Mr. Carey, Mr. Fadabin, Mr. Dwyer, Mrs. Gerber, Mr. Liu, Mr. Convertito, Mrs. Kennelly. Voting in favor, all opposed, Mrs. Brand and Mrs. Iacono. Motion passes seven to two. So this item will move to policy. Thank you. New business, quarterly financial update. I'm going to ask uh, Mrs. Munsell to come up and join the fun. You have the document in your packet. Uh, the report was enclosure number four. Um, second quarter report as of December 31st gets us um, halfway through the fiscal year. Um, I'm pleased to um, report that um, in total our projected expenses um, are anticipated to be within budget. Uh, we do have areas um, within the budget that will exceed their respective um, appropriations. Uh, those are in the areas of uh, maintenance due to unanticipated maintenance projects and transportation due to modifications um, in the bus tiers and uh, number of runs. Um, we do have um, significant savings in electricity because of a uh, town bid last um, spring, late sp last spring, uh, and staff turnover that will um, cover those overages. Um, we will, you know, continue to operate as normal, normal encumber funds and make purchases as needing, needed so there's no other impact on uh, other areas of the budget. Um, just to highlight the other, the, um, the different categories that we report on in, in this report for staffing, um, 
we are two FTEs over over the um, budget and staffing. Um, last report, I reported we were within budget by, it, I don't know if I reported the amount, but it was a quarter of a FTE. But we had to add um, a new kindergarten class at Holland Hill in October. Um, and there was another um, para, 0.6 para added at Stratfield, so that brought us over. Um, regarding fixed charges or benefits, there's really nothing there to report um, other than the, the additional um, $450,000 contribution went into the retention fund. Um, pupil personnel, um, special ed is within budget. Um, they, they seem to be doing well. Um, I did want to mention that excess cost is anticipated to come in less than what was um, budgeted, but that's expected because expenses are lower and it's a function of the expenses. Um, school expenses are, are being expended um, as you would expect, um, as well as support, professional development, um, you know, it, um, instructional uh, programs, program implementation, that kind of thing. Um, maintenance and transportation, those are the, t the two um, problem areas. Transportation is expected to be over by about 190,000. That's um, both regular and some special education transportation. Um, we do, you know, heating is hard to predict at this point uh, in the year because we, or we haven't gotten through the heating season yet. So, um, you know, we're, we're just expecting to expend anything that we had budgeted for heating. Um, and capital virtually, you know, our capital um, funds have been expended for equipment that was budgeted as you would expect by this time of the year. So um, those are the highlights of the, the different areas of the budget. Thank any you. questions? Does yeah. anybody have any questions? Mr. Carey and Mr. Liu. Yes, uh, thank you to the chair, to Ms. Munsell. Um, looking at the uh, pupil personnel expense, just to make sure I understand this correctly, it looks like we're over on tuition. I'm assuming that's outplacement tuition. That's um, because of excess cost. There's an excess cost offset it's there. Just when because we, we haven't taken the excess cost in yet. Right, we haven't gotten it yet. Okay. Right. I just I, I heard you say it, but I just wanted to make sure because it's yeah. such a big number that yeah. I, I couldn't get my fixation away from it. Um, the other question I had for you uh, was: Were any of the maintenance projects, uh, and this is to the superintendent or staff, any of the maintenance projects that are surprises? related to things that we asked for but were denied? Uh, no, unfortunately. They were other things. <laughs> okay. So we uh, had a big issue with one of the boilers at Ward. It's basically conked out on us, and we have no choice but to replace it. Um, and uh, that's, that was one of the big items. But uh, the Dwight boiler is still going. <laughs> Whether it will make it through the winter, we don't know. Exactly. Um, but we, you know, the, the issues that came up uh, were on unanticipated, and they were not in areas that uh, we had requested a capital project for. Thank Mr. you very much. Mr. Lowe. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Munsell, you had said a, we were over 190000 in transportation, and you had just said um, because of the modification of the bus tier and bus runs. Mm -hmm. Can you clarify what that means exactly? Mm -hmm. um, Apparently, during the budget process, there were some changes in start times or, you know, things had to be reconfigured as far as how the buses ran. And um, estimates had to be made as to how many buses and how many tiers um, each bus, the pricing is different for a bus depending on how many tiers it runs, um, high school, middle, and, and elementary. Um, so that wasn't quite what was anticipated in the budget. So we're running more tiers for the same number of buses than we anticipated. The bus numbers are correct, but we're running a lot more three-tier buses instead of one-tier buses, and so the pricing went up. And there were some special ed kids mm -hmm. routes for special ed that switched as kids moved in and out of the district. So that's the combination of things hit us there. Pretty complicated year to budget for buses. Mm. Thank you. 
Anybody else? Mrs. Brand? Yeah, there were a couple of things. Um, I looked at fixed charges, and one of the things I was looking at that perhaps I'm not understanding correctly, but if we go to page three, and the first line is health insurance, and it says used 99.98%, do you mean you expect to use that at the end of the year, or do you mean it is where we are currently? The 99.98% is the percentage used already. Already. Of, right. It, the payment's been made. Then, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, we're mid-year, and I'm just wondering how we're going to pay the remainder of our claims if we... Don't. No, we, we, we make the payment into the medical retention fund right. up front. It's paid in advance. It's paid in advance. It's all paid. Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh, you're not reflecting claims. You're, fa you're saying... Right. Which, oh, I beg your pardon. Okay, thank you. That helps tremendously. Thank you. Um, and the other part was, do we expect to have the same expenditure with the busing that we saw currently in this quarterly report also built in as a need for next year? So if we're looking at transportation costs Coming for up. next year. Yes, I know. It's, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Taken into consideration. Yes. <laughs> you will see it. Um, the last thing, if we have an um, um, amount that needs to be, tr will we have a need, do you anticipate any needs for transfers coming up in any time soon? Uh, not right now because we're within categories right now. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I was wondering, we don't have the specific pieces laid out, but we don't generally get a report on our budget for food services until the end of the year. And since the school district and the board decided to choose an, um, a healthy school lunch program, I wonder if it would be possible to have a budget report on food service at some meeting soon, perhaps the 24th, depending on what's on the agenda. And the reason is I, I, I don't want to find out that we are in June, um, aren't financially secure, and that puts the healthy food program at risk. I'd just like to know where we are before we get to June. Okay, will you see what we can do? That'd be great. Thank you. Mr. Convertito? On page one of one, um, and I guess it refers to capital, 400, that, that 450000 is the budget transfer that took place last June in the vote? Is that what I'm looking at? Those were the switches. Yeah. The fixed, from fixed charges, from capital to fixed charges? That four fifty. Yes. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Mr. Liu? I'm sorry. It's from to, through the chair to Dr. Title. Um, so when we talked about the transportation overages here, uh, Mrs. Munsell had said that, you know, it was the tiers and the, the, the start times. Weren't the start times supposed to save us money? They did. They saved us money. Um, compared to what we would be spending had we not changed the start times. Um, so we uh, actually reduced the number of buses in service um, by 10 because of the change in the high school start times. Then, as you know, we added buses in for the grandfathering. Um, so the net of that was still a savings over what we would have had to spend. So yes, we did, we did save money on the change of the start times. Um, it's just until we actually know where all the kids are and they actually plot out the routes just don't know how many tiers you have to run to get kids there and that's where it's very uh, very tricky so we were just right on in terms of number of buses and it did save us money by changing the start time significant amount of money I, I still it's still so I guess then what is it, it what is it exactly and maybe we could see some of the reports for the buses that made it go up by almost two hundred thousand dollars yeah we there's a, a lot of detail about the routes and the runs and how long they are and there's overages that um, have to do with uh, we pay some buses um, we schedule a bus for five hours for say a special ed run or something um, when they go run the route or the traffic is bad and the bus runs for six hours we have to pay extra for that and that's part of this as well it's not all just a matter of extra tiers so there's a lot of things that go into this um, so students move around, special ed students moving in and out of the district can have an impact on it as well. So there's so quite a bit of detail, you know, behind this that um, 
we can provide if people want to look at it. So when we were going through that whole middle school feeder plan um, craziness, and, uh, and we were sort of said, hey, this is what it was going to cost, I guess they didn't get as close as they thought they were going to. I mean, it's really, it's not like a little amount. Well, it's not a little amount in, in total, but the, um, the transportation budget in total is seven, seven million seven dollars. Million dollars. So, I, you know, yes, 190,000 is a lot of money as gosh. a percentage of the budget. It's in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, but, I'm right. the buy of my particular yeah. budget, and I'm sure everyone at this table, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, well, and maybe even the town. I, I'm not trying to yeah, I, know. You, I, it's a, I know it puts you in a difficult position, but this is what we're supposed to be doing here. And I know there was a lot of a difficult position. Well, there was a lot of hair. Be. There was a lot of hair. Well, no, I'm, yeah. I'm supposed to be asking you the questions that right. have to just be straightforward. And right. we were all pulling our hair out during that um, middle school feeder plan, trying to figure this out. And we were assured that it was going to be expensive, but it wasn't going to go anymore. So now it's it's this more. And, and I, I have to say, it just... Uh, it, it makes you kind of just. As a point of clarification, yep. I don't think we were ever told it wasn't going to go anymore. And just to comment, it's one hundred ninety thousand dollars, which is a lot of money, um, but it's not all from the grandfathering. It's it's special ed as well, so um, it's unfair to link all of the number to one particular action of the board. Um, it's a combination of a couple of things. Is there any other discussion on the um, report? not we'll move to the next item thank you very much Storing, for your work thanks on Storing. This. I should point out that the timing of this was not great <laughs> because she was working on this at the same time we were trying to put this entire budget together so it's a bit of a bit of a scramble um, the next so are we ready to move on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. The next item on our agenda is the distribution and presentation of the superintendent's recommended 2012-2013 operating budget and capital improvement projects. Right. Um, I just want to point out to the board that tonight we're being presented the budget. This is not a budget discussion session. We are hearing from the superintendent. We will get to take all the materials home. We will have a full week to go through them, vet them, digest them, read them, sleep with them, whatever we would like to do, and come back with all kinds of questions at our next meeting. Certainly, if you have questions in advance that you would like to send through the chair to central office so that they can start to work on them and be prepared when we go into our budget work next week, that would be most beneficial. Um, and in advance, I would just like to take the opportunity to thank Mrs. Munsell because I know being new to the district was not easy to come in here and get hit with all of this and put it all together on a very quick time frame compared to what we have done in the past on top of all of it. So thank you. Okay. Ms. Dr. Title. Okay, the way I would like to proceed with this because I, one of the rules in teaching is once you, do, once you give out the handout, you're going to lose everyone's attention. <laughs> Right, Jennifer? Yeah. Right. So what I'd, like to, what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes just giving you the high points of this, what's in, what the number is. There's actually two documents that we'll then distribute. One is the operating budget, and then this year we did a separate document on the capital projects. Previously, the capital projects had been like a one page in the back. We really wanted to beef that up and get a lot of questions answered, so you're going to get two, two door prizes tonight. Um, and then we have, like, a lot of copies stored in a secret vault, like Price Waterhouse, right? This is like the bracket. This is like the 64. See who the number one seeds are. Um, and, and so I want to go over some of the highlights fairly quickly, and then um, we'll pass out the books. Then I would just like to take a few minutes while people are like to sort of walk you through the document, because we made a few changes to the format this year, not major changes, but I think some enhancements. We just wanted to point that out for everybody. So. Um, this uh, budget uh, here has some improvements in it, some initiatives in it, um, and at the same time, I think, is very fiscally uh, responsible. Um, some of the improvements you'll see in this budget um, include extending the elementary math support model that we started last year. If you recall, we did an elementary staffing model. One of the elements we were trying to beef up was support for students in math. 
We're extending that to the middle schools and to the high school. The details are in there. I'm proposing an additional 1.0 FTE of a math resource teacher for each middle school to address students' math performance and an additional 0.4 at each high school to continue our support for kids uh, who are moving out of Algebra 1 into Geometry and Algebra 2. So we're extending our math model uh, upward. Um, we have done a complete reconfiguration of special education staffing at the elementary schools um, to more effectively deliver special education services. Um, there are major staffing implications for this. Um, there are also uh, offsets for this as well. Um, we have improved funding for a number of our instructional initiatives, math, language arts, health, and music. These were uh, areas that the board either will be approving uh, this year or is already approved. Um, under our new cycle of curriculum development, um, as programs come up for review and approval, we then want to support them with the resources. Um, and so there's more money in instructional initiatives than we've had in the past. Um, we have put funding into the operating budget for a new student information system. This was something flagged in the audit, something that is sorely needed in the district. Um, we are carrying that in this budget. Um, we are doing some reconfiguration and improvement to, to ELL services, English language learner services at the elementary level. That's actually a growing population and need in the district. Um, we haven't had um, as coordinated effort in that as we needed to, and we are seeking to improve that. Um, we are uh, adding, uh, proposing to add afternoon office coverage at the elementary schools that don't have it right now. Um, nine of our elementary schools have nobody. Um, it, we have the one, the one secretary, um, but we don't have full coverage uh, in the afternoon at the elementary schools, so we're asking for part-time assistance there, and particularly to help with afternoon issues and bus kids who get dropped off on buses and brought back to school and there's nobody in the office. Um, we have added additional staff. I'm proposing that additional staff to handle our increasing high school enrollment. Um, we weren't able to um, address that as well as we needed to last year. Enrollment is once again going up in the district for next year on our projection. We did have our enrollment projections rerun by MGT. If you remember, they did a full enrollment study last year. Um, we contracted with them for a one-year update of that so we would get uh, cleaner numbers, uh, looking at the 10-1-11 uh, actuals. Um, there's no doubt the high school enrollment's going up. We need to address it. The budget addresses it. Um, improving of maintenance services. Um, we're putting some more money into some preventive maintenance programs, including our roofs. Um, and we also are asking for uh, additional uh, plumber for the district. We have, as they say, quite a backlog. Oh, you were waiting all night for that, weren't you? I tried that out yesterday, and nobody laughed then. Okay. Um, and we have funded this, the survey and some professional development for the Safe School Climate Plan, as I referenced uh, before. So all of those initiatives, you know, all of those improvements, many of them, as I've said to you in the past and pledged to you and said to the staff, many of them are coming with offsets in different parts of the budget because we're just not in a fiscal time. We can just add and add and add. Wherever possible, we need to try to find some savings. Um, for all of this, um, the budget increase this year that I'm recommending is 2.6%. Um, the reason we can make some improvements in the district and initiatives for this modest increase um, is that we have some areas of this budget that are the increases are moderate compared to prior years. For example, this year, our average settlement for settled contracts is about 2%. Uh, last year's budget was built on a much higher figure. So that helps. Um, our health insurance costs are moderated. We had another very good year in terms of experience. I did distribute the Aon report last Friday to everybody, and you can see that the claims were very favorable. Um, so that helps us. We had changes in the employee contribution and plan designs. We talked about those during the contract discussions. Um, and, of course, the uh, cap on the board's medical retention fund that we had long discussion about. Um, our pension costs for non-certified employees, while they're going up, they're moderate. And because last year we bit the bullet and funded appropriately special ed tuition, if you remember, last year we put a big number in for that. We had to swallow a pretty big increase because historically that had been overexpended. You heard the words that you almost never hear from the business manager, special education is within budget. Music to my ears. Because we took our medicine last year, we don't have to go back to that 
well this year. So we're budgeted um, accurately. Um, some areas actually show reductions year over year. Um, the biggest area is utilities. Um, as Doreen mentioned, the town last June um, rebid the electrical contract for the whole town. And so we're seeing a significant savings in electrical costs. I'd like to take credit for that, but it really wasn't on anything, anything that we did. Uh, legal fees are going down because the number of contracts we need to negotiate is going down. If you remember, we had bumped that up last year. So again, I don't just bring things forward. If we don't think we need it, we roll them back. So the legal costs are being rolled back. And if you remember the, the course reimbursement piece from the contract, we, we can take a reduction in that, in that account. A um, few other quick factors, then we'll distribute the, the books. Um, if you remember, we started this year um, with a sliding scale for preschool tuition. We had uh, anticipated a certain level of revenue for that. Um, that program has been incredibly successful, and we've got a lot more revenue than we anticipated, and that allows us to offset some of those expenses for the preschool program. Um, so that's reflected in there. We didn't use the temptation that some districts did to use grant funds um, to pay some expenses that would then cause a funding cliff when the grants expired, the old funding cliff problem. We didn't do that. So that pays off this year because we're not backfilling in grant money because we used it as has happened in the past. Um, we are budgeting for the increased transportation costs. Um, we are going to need um, to add a bus or two because of, frankly, increasing enrollment. Um, and some of these additional runs, in addition, uh, there's a contract increase of 3%. This is, we're going into the last year of the transportation contract. So we have one more year of first student where we'll be bidding that contract out you know, in the next few months. But for now, that's a fixed cost we can't do anything about. We also need to fund appropriately custodial overtime. That thing is run in the red um, by a lot of money for a number of years, and this is the year to take the medicine on that. And as much as we can try to hold back on that, the fact is we need to budget for that more accurately. Um, and so that is in there. And that Virtually every initiative and improvement that I referenced before comes with some cost offsets, and that limits the net impact to the, to the budget. So um, it's 2.6%. It has, um, I think, a lot to offer. And I think at this point, we would like to distribute, take a five-minute stretch break and let the staff distribute. If you're someone who normally gets a budget, we actually have one with your name on it. Uh, <laughs> we have some extras for people that are table copies, um, so they're here somewhere, okay. and now be unveiled. Like, all right, why don't we just like, take, take a, a three-minute recess and some people may want to take it and leave. <laughs> That's right, no drum roll. Thank you. All right, now that you have your book in front of you, Dr. Title's just going to walk you through some of the uh, changes in the book. Ooh. Shh. Thank you. Quiet. I realize I almost stand between this board and adjournment, and I really don't want to be there. <laughs> I'm the mom um, of three boys. Right. Um, so I just want to let people know that this document um, will be up on the district website. The operating budget will be up probably in the next 10 minutes or so, depending on when we press the button. And the uh, capital projects budget will probably be up by noon tomorrow. So anybody who's uh, not here and would like to get a sneak peek, it'll be on the district website. Um, so the, uh, the part that's probably the most uh, changed from last year um, is the executive summary. So the income section is about the way you've seen it before. Um, we did change the detail on the uh, grants and where they're used. We did allocate all of the money as we've done before. But the executive summary, which begins on page 15, is probably the most different looking part of this. And that's uh, it's kind of a good place to start your budget review. Um, so we have a one-page executive summary that's color-coded. So remember these colors because you'll see them later in the book. Um, and so each of, for each of the 11 major uh, objects, you can see the change in each object by the percent that has gone up, but also the impact on the overall budget. So, for example, 
um, in staff salaries on page 15, staff salaries in total go up 2.19 percent um, as a, so of the 2.60 percent, it's, it's 1.45. So that's most of the increase is there. Um, so we've done this similar, similarly before, but that's just a little different. What's different is the next few pages, we take each of those 11 and break them down and give you more detail behind the changes. We've tried to move the description of what each thing is right up front here. The 16 and 17 are a little busy, but you'll see it spreads out from there. In the past, this description of what was in there was way in the back, and you'd be flipping back and forth to find it. Now it's kind of all in one place. So if you want to see what's the action in staff salaries, it's broken down by the different objects on page 17, 101, 103, 105. So you can see where the action is there. And just as an example, you'll see that the teaching staff has an increase there. If you go down to paraprofessional staff, there's actually a decrease. And, that, and just to point out, and there's detail around this later in the budget, that our new model for special education staffing at the elementary level adds certified special education teachers, but some of the offsets are in some of the paraprofessional staff. So you'll see that reflected in there, and there's a description uh, in that. And so each page then has its own sort of next level of detail. So the next page is benefits, 18 and 19, where generally the description is on the facing page, and the description of any of the changes in the budget are next to the chart. So on for example, page 18 sort of just explains what's in those accounts, whereas page 19 will explain, you know, some of the differences. So you don't have to flip back and forth. Uh, I couldn't fit all of maintenance in there, but you'll see it. So that's just, so that's sort of like a next level of detail. You've got the one-page executive summary, and then you've got this, like, 22-page executive summary that's a little more detailed. So you can access this budget at different levels of detail, depending on what you, what you like to do. Um, the, uh, and so that's, that ends. And then, uh, so, so that all ends, the last page of that section is page 35, for the very simple dues and fees. All right. And so the colors then match the colors on the first page of the executive summary. Then in the budget detail, this is the exact same report we used last year. No change to this um, at all. Um, and then what you'll see is, though, as you flip through, you'll see some colored lines um, that correspond back to the executive summaries by color. So just if you go to, say, page 42 and 43, right? You'll see that 103 certified support staff totals are green, which is the same green from the prior parts. So just at the summary object level, do you have those stripes? So you can, as we review this, you can say, well, let's go to the green section. We'll know what you're talking about. I need that. Thank okay. you. <laughs> okay. So th that's, um, but, I'll, but that report, for those of you that were on the board last year, if you looked at the budget last year, the guts, the, the real detail of the budget, that report hasn't changed. So that's really a carryover. Um, and also the budget by department, that really hasn't changed. Um, the only thing I would caution people to do, that if you're looking at a particular school's budget and you're looking at the changes in FTEs, that you not simply look at that um, in the budget by department because that does not include staff that are funded by grants. So if you're from school X and you want to know what changes in your FTE count are, um, this only covers people paid out of the operating budget. Um, there are uh, later pages that will show you the, the staffing by school um, total by grant and operating budget. Um, and then there's uh, you know enro enrollment information, class sizes, some of this is all carryover, just updated. Um, we updated all the class size teacher load rules. That was a very popular chart last year. Margaret Mary got a lot of kudos for that, so we updated that to reflect the new contracts. Um, and um, the total staffing page, 123, just want to call your attention to that uh, for a moment. That was another favored page last year as we went through this. The total staffing page, now we have a, a year of history on here as well. So we have the 010, the 1011 actuals. 
by certified, non-certified, and by funding source. And then um, the 11, 12 actuals, and then the budget and the difference for the proposed. So that's the, um, that's the total staffing. The changes in the staffing are on the next page. In the operating budget, changes to the staffing. We do have a decline in enrollment anticipated at the elementary level. There will be fewer positions at the elementary level, but the class size guidelines we followed are the same ones that we followed this past year. We did not change the class size. All we did was reflect the enrollment. And the page, if you want to look at staffing by school or department, uh, that begins, the best place to find that, if you're looking for a particular school or department, begins on page 128. Because that shows you Board of Ed, grant, and total. And that goes on for several pages. Then there's some more backup information. Um, You've seen before backup on the tech department, and then uh, the major maintenance projects. We did some additional work on those, um, and so you'll see some pictures and so forth, and why we want to do some of those projects more detail behind that. And there is a um, food service program budget in here, so Mrs. Brand, this may be just what you're looking for. So let us know if that meets your needs. So there is a food service budget in there. The food service budget begins on. Well, there's a section on food service. Begins on 164, and then it goes on to the end of the document, 169. And so that's that's your to guided tour of the budget book, um, the capital improvements, which is our uh, two million dollars in capital that we're allowed to request, not necessarily get. You'll see this is much more detailed. It has photographs. It has some before and after pictures. Um, we had some projects that were turned down last year. We have put those back in because those problems did not go away. So uh, you will see in this just briefly um, the Dwight boilers are back, the other half of the Jennings bathrooms, um, the Tomlinson facade work. That hasn't gotten any better since we didn't do anything to it. Uh, so it's back in. The new items in here is a very large window replacement project at Osborne Hill. Um, that is scheduled in the facilities plan, um, Tomlinson Middle School flooring system, and we have a traffic project to relieve some of the congestion at Tomlinson that we took to the police commission. We've been working with the police for this for a number of months now, and um, then all the oil tanks that are underground that need to come out. But that's what's in the capital improvements. And I would, just before I close and Pam sends you off with your homework assignment. Really want to thank not just Doreen, who did remarkable work on this uh, in a short period of time, but the staff in the central office who scrambled to put this thing together uh, down in the business office um, just did a terrific job. It's like a total team effort and trying to roll a boat here uh, and to get this out to you sooner. So um, that's where we are. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, the next item on our agenda is public comments and petitions. Um, does anybody wish to speak at this time? The rules for such are listed on our agenda. Great. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Hi, Ann Pasco, FEA. I just would like some information for the next meeting from Mrs. Brand's report from the, um, the health regarding school nurse and administration of medication. Um, I believe what I heard was that extracurricular activities, um, the adults in charge may not medicate. I just want that clarified. And I believe students may not medicate themselves. So if you could just next time explain who is going to give those youngsters their med medication when they go, for example, on 
a field trip or you said extracurricular. It already came to me that the ski teams, for example, are part of um, the clubs. And if they have to hire a nurse, they wanted clarification. So if you could just address that next time, that would be fine. How and who's going to do that in that space that's not covered anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? OK. <coughs> next item on the agenda is open board comment. Does anybody have any items for open board comment? Um, Mr. Convertito, Mr. Liu, and then I have something from the town clerk that I need to discuss with everyone. Uh, just very quickly, and thanks for the, uh, the overview on the budget. Um, just one quick question. Things that were cut last year because of the budget cut, have any of those been restored in this budget? And if so, is there a place in the budget we can see that? Uh, no, there was no uh, attempt to restore to the budget, but I can get into the details around that at the next meeting and the thought process on building the budget. Mr. Liu? Thank you. Um, yesterday, my seven-year-old comes home and says if he can ask to have um, popcorn chicken every day of the week. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'd been hearing this rumbling around, around the town. And, of course, you know, my 10-year-old chimes right in and says that he wants pizza the next week every day of the week. Um, and what I guess I'd like to ask for tonight is maybe get a couple of uh, other board members to support me on this to get this on the agenda for next time, next uh, January 24th is that we have some discussion about our food services because I, uh, I have been happy with some of the progress that the food services has been making, but um, I'm kind of at a loss for words at this new alternative uh, day that allows a kid, if without <laughs> guidance, to be able to choose pizza for every day of the week for his meal. I just don't see how that promotes healthy eating. And so I'd like to put on the agenda that we uh, we review our food services and our commitment to promoting healthy food. Could I get two other board members to uh, support me on this? I would just ask to say that we're in the midst of budget season, and if you could hold off until February or later meeting, that would be most beneficial and helpful. When is the next, when's the February meeting? It's like. Um, and if you want to send that request through the chair and get, try and get two other people to support you, that would be Yeah, fine. I'd like to send it through the chair, please. Okay. Um, perhaps when we're talking about the budget and the food service portion of that, whether the staff uh, who would be here at that time for that discussion could comment about whether the budget supports continuing the Healthy Foods Initiative uh, or improving upon it, that might be a reasonable question to be asked during the budget review process. And so wh whatever night we're doing that, if the staff could be available to discuss it from that perspective. You have another person. Okay. <clears throat> on the on, yes. Go ahead, <laughs> Mrs. Brand. Sorry. No. It it it. For clarification, actually, that was why um, earlier when I spoke to the Board of Health report, there are clearly a gap in, in mutual understandings of with this new legislation regarding what school nurses and how they can delegate. I think needs to go to policy. I think we need to have a protocol in place so people can better understand it, and I think the information needs to get out. It's, I'm aware of it. It actually was reported earlier at a board meeting, but I, don't, I think we have a gap in how this is actually going to play out, and that's why I think we need to have a discussion at the policy regarding okay. it. Okay. Thank you all for making your discussions clear. Um, you're happy to send an email and make a discussion you know, request through the chair. Um, I just have one item on open board comment that I need to go through. It's a procedural thing. Um, you all received in your Friday packet um, a letter from the town clerk um, stating um, scheduling of meetings, FOI, that type of thing. But in it, she says that we need to please distribute and discuss with your membership the enclosed article number 11 of the town charter standards of conduct. So pursuant to her letter, I am prepared to read and then we can discuss the standards of conduct unless you all are comfortable that you read them and don't have any questions at this time. Do you prefer that I read them all right now? It's a one-page document or are you all comfortable that you read them and understand them? Mr. Carey. 
I'll, I'll move to waive the reading. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. So we can report back to the town clerk that we've all read and understand the standards of conduct. Thank you. That's all I had. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Moved by Mrs. Brand, seconded by Mr. Carey. Thank you all very much.